for joining us for our second to last Bible study in the series called Anchored. We've been going through this Bible study book together, looking at different storms in the Bible and how when we go through our own personal storms, we could be anchored in God's word and in who he is and who we are in him. Today, I have looked so forward to this lesson because I feel like it is so important and something that God has definitely taught me in my life through my storms. Today, we're going to be speaking on how you can serve others, even when you're in the middle of your own storm. Um, we so often, when we are in our own storm, get consumed with that storm and how it affects us. And sometimes we can get so blinded to others around us going through the same thing. And when you are going through a personal storm, a personal trial or tragedy, the best thing, in my opinion, that you can do to help yourself get through that storm is to look around and care for the needs of others. Um, so we're going to look at Paul today and an actual storm that he went through. We hear um, his of his own account that he went through several storms and shipwrecks, and we are going to be looking at one of those today. If you have ever been in a car accident, um, you remember that day. You remember... Um, being hit or hitting someone, that sense of being completely out of control, maybe the fear that came over you, um, wondering if you had any um, broken bones or a concussion or cuts or scrapes, and then you go to, well, how am I going to get this car fixed? It's going to be a lot of money on top of that. And maybe for the first few years after that wreck, and you feel those kind of pains and aches afterwards, you'll begin to refer to it as, well, that was before the accident, or that was after the accident. And then when you hear somebody else say something, or you hear of someone else being in an accident, you immediately are right back in that spot where you were, and you remember, oh yes, that was terrible. I remember exactly how that felt. Well, it's the same way for if you have been through um, maybe a divorce and someone else close to you is going through a divorce. You 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 understand more. Um, maybe if you have lost a parent and someone, um, a friend of yours, loses their parent, you understand more. There is something to be said about going through your own storm and then being able to use that experience to help someone in their kind of exact same storm that they're going through. It's more than just having sympathy or empathy. You really do relate to them on a whole nother level. Have you ever gone through something and people people mean well <laughs> when they say things, when um, we're going through things, they, they don't know what to say and so they say the cliche things. And maybe you've been going through something, you've gone through something hard, maybe a loss, you're dealing with grief and someone will come up to you and say, well, um, I know what you're going through. And you think, mm, but do you? Do you know what I'm going through? And they mean well. Um, but when you go through something and then another person goes through that same thing, you truly can say, I know what you're going through. And then at that time, being on the backside of it, you probably wouldn't use that cliche because you know how um, shallow it comes across at times. Um, but um, Paul, as we said before, is, as we're reading, he's getting ready to go into the ship, um, into this wreck on his ship. And he suffered so many different difficulties in his life and um, afflictions and being persecuted. Um, he says in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And then the shipwreck that we're going to talk about today, that's the fourth one. That was after he said this in 2 Corinthians. Paul knew what it was to suffer. Paul knew what it was to go through um, like physical storms as well as spiritual storms in his life. 
And through this, we see that Paul was able to help other people even while he was still in this storm. So we're going to start reading in Acts 27, verse 14, and we're going to go through verse 20. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up the wind, we let her drive, meaning we couldn't even steer it at this point. The wind was so rough, we just, we let go of the sails, we let go of the wheel, everything that was going on, the wind just took over. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. So they're now trying to um, save what they can as far as themselves in the boat. And so they are letting go of all things that were in the ship, all the food, all the um, tools, crates, everything that wasn't the people in the boat, so the boat would not sink. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Um, verse 20, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. Can you imagine being in a boat, being in a huge storm, and not seeing any kind of light for days, no sun, no moon, no stars. That's how big the storm was, days. They didn't know if it was day or night. They didn't know where they were going. They had no control over the ship. They had no food, and they didn't know when the storm was gonna end. That would be extremely terrifying. Yet, in the middle of all of this, Paul steps up as a prisoner on the ship, not as someone in command, not as someone in authority. He is a prisoner on the ship. He steps up, becomes the authority figure, basically, and tries to calm down the men on the ship, tries to give them some encouragement. We'll keep reading verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. I looked up that word abstinence and it speaks of, it's the only time this word is used in the Bible, but it speaks of fasting or having gone a long time without food. Abst abstinence from food is what this is talking about. So they are starving at this point. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and says, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. If you read earlier in the chapter, um, so Paul is a prisoner. They're taking him to Rome to be tried. And when they um, are trying, they are on different ships and they go from city to city. And when they're leaving Crete, Paul tells them, I don't think this is a good idea. We're gonna, there's gonna be perils. You're gonna be afraid for your life. And yet they go anyway. And so he's telling them, he's basically saying, I told you so. And now verse 22, I exhort you to be of good cheer. He, they are in the middle of a storm, cannot see anything, have no way to control the boat. They have no food. They haven't eaten in days. And Paul stands up and says, be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So no person is going to die, but the ship is going to be gone. It's going to be wrecked for there stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Paul knew who he was. Paul knew why he was there. He knew the God that he was serving. This angel saying, verse 24, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sell with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. He says it a second time. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul didn't need to wait until after the storm before he could stand up and encourage these men. He didn't wait until he got his own bearings. He didn't wait until maybe he was healed um, from being tossed back and forth, maybe the bruises or whatever. He didn't wait until um, he was on steady ground. He was able to encourage these men even while he was going through the storm. Now, 
there are times when we go through personal storms that we do need a time of rest and renewal in Jesus. We've spent time on that in um, past lessons. So I'm not saying that, but there comes a time where you have to give your fears and doubts and rely on the strength of God to be able to um, carry you through the storm and while you are there, be able to help someone else in their storm, in their time of need. You know, sometimes um, there, we have no option but to help the people around us. Um, maybe a wife who has lost her husband. Um, she has her children to take care of. There's, she has to kind of set herself aside to take care of her children. Maybe it's a pastor um, in a church and the church goes through something tragic. The pastor has to set aside his own feelings for a time being to minister to the people within the church. There are times where you're kind of forced to, but God doesn't want you to necessarily be forced every time to help someone else. So how can you, when you are in an all-consuming storm, that you feel like you can barely breathe, you can barely move, how can you then, in the middle of that, while you're feeling that way, help someone else? Well, we're gonna look at five characteristics of someone who can help others even when she is in a storm. So number one, someone who is clear on who she is in Christ. Okay, let's go back to what we were talking about with Paul. Remember, he's a prisoner but he stands up in the middle of the storm, in the middle of all of them, a prisoner. So he could have, you know, as taken charge like this, he could have been thrown overboard. He didn't know how, I mean, I guess he did with the angel telling him that no one would be lost, but that could have happened. A prisoner wasn't supposed to stand up and speak and address everyone like that. As a prisoner, he stood up and in the midst of them, and he said, verse 23, for there stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Have you ever seen someone that was defined by their past? Now the past is gonna affect us. The storms that we go through, the trials that we face, they are gonna affect us. You cannot go through something unscathed. Um, you cannot go through something traumatic and not feel any repercussions from that. It is going to affect you. But I have met many women, many men that are defined by their past. Every time you talk to them, well, the reason they're that way in their mind is because so-and-so did such and such or because they went through this and this 20 years ago. They can't let go of that. And because of that, it not only has changed them, but it is who they are. That trauma, that trial, that disappointment is all they see in their life. They're not able to get past that. They're not able to get victory. And it does affect us. Please don't misunderstand me. I get that. It does affect us and it will change us, but it should not define you. It should not be all that you think about, all you're consumed about, and every time something good or something bad happens in your life, you immediately relate it back to that instance, to that trial or storm. Paul's life was so much bigger than the storms that he faced. And we just read that verse about all the different trials and stuff that he went through. He only ever talked about those if it was beneficial to the people that he was ministering to. Otherwise, Every time that Paul suffered persecution, that Paul was beaten, that Paul went through some kind of trial, was kicked out of town, you see that he turns around and he goes to a different town or he again starts preaching after he's released from prison or after he's um, been persecuted. He's constantly following the Lord and what the Lord has for him. Um, Paul's identity as one who belonged to and served Christ was so clear that as he addressed the other men on the ship, he identified himself as belonging to Christ. So letter A, his ownership. In that verse, he says, whose I am. He took joy in knowing that he was Christ's. 
Do you do that? Do I do that? Not only do we take joy in his ownership of our life, but do you truly belong to him? First of all, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Um, if we go through nine weeks of this course and you still are unsure of your salvation, there's an issue there. You need to reach out to me, comment, send me a, an, a, a message, um, reach out to your pastor or pastor's wife if you are struggling with your salvation. But on top of if we belong to him, do we like the fact that he owns us, that he wants our life, that he wants to use us. We belong to Christ through three different ways. First of all, through his creation. He has us, he owns us, he, um, we are his because he created us. Psalms 100 verse 3, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. There's that ownership and the sheep of his pasture. Jeremiah 18, 6. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. As the potter takes the clay and does whatever he wants to with that clay, the Lord wants to do the same with us and has the ability to as we are his creation. Then secondly, we are his through redemption. If you are saved, and I hope that everyone listening is, then you have been redeemed. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. There's that ownership again, because Christ redeemed us. Because we are saved through his blood, by his blood, by faith, we should be his and should be willing to be his because of that precious blood that bought us. And then thirdly, we are his through consecration. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. We need to give over to him everything in our life being willing to lay down our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own desires in order to be the sacrifice, the living sacrifice that he wants us to be. There's another verse that tells us to die daily to self. We have to take our sin nature, what we want to do, what feels good and feels natural, and we have to put that aside in order to follow what God has for us. That verse goes on to say, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's what you should be doing. It's the least you should do for everything that God has done for us. When we recognize God's ownership in our lives and his loving sacrifice to redeem us, the only reasonable response is to purposefully yield ourselves to him. Then we will know whose we are, just like Paul did. And then he shows his allegiance. So um, he says, whose I am. And then he says, and whom I serve. He was tied to the Lord. He wanted to serve him. He wanted to live for him. He had allegiance to him. When we um, trust Christ as our savior, we, we remove the allegiance that we had to ourselves or the allegiance that we had to other things, um, idols in our life, and maybe not stone idols or wooden idols that we hear about in the Bible, but idols that served us, that made us feel good, that lifted us up. We put all of that aside and our allegiance is now to God. First Thessalonians 1 9 says, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We don't have to find our identity in the things around us in what we can do, in what the world titles that the world might give us. Our identity is not in that. If you feel like if the thing that you are living for is so people can see that you are a good mom or a good wife or a good coworker, um, a good um assistant, whatever, a good teacher, whatever title you have in life. Um, and a lot of us have many different titles. If we are living where the people around us say, oh, well, she's a good 
and enter in your title, you are going to live with um, regret. You are going to live under this kind of shadow and cloud because not every day are you going to be good or the best at that certain title. You have to make sure that your identity is found in Christ, that you see who you are by what God sees who you are through his son. And God sees you as um, a Christian as his son or his daughter. God sees you as beautifully and wonderfully made. There are so many different promises in the Bible that God sees you as. We don't have to find our identity in anything else but what God tells us. Hebrews 9 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then Colossians 3, 23 and 24, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. In the middle of a storm, clarity on who you are and what you do next is essential. Paul found that clarity in knowing whose he was, and who he served. And you can have that same clarity. If your focus, and we've talked about this um, when Peter stepped out on that boat in the middle of the storm, if your focus is on God and what he wants for you, that you are his, that you are there to serve him in the middle of a storm, you are then able to look around and see others who might need some encouragement, just like Paul was able to do. So then, number two, we see someone who hopes in God's word. How do you help others in a storm when you're going through the storm? It has to be um, someone. You have to be able to hope in God's word. We read Paul's story here about the shipwreck, and we read it so quickly, it seems like it passed in a couple of minutes because it's just verse by verse. Um, but we find out that this storm lasted 14 days, two weeks. He was on the ship in the storm day and night. Um, I think that he would have been afraid. Paul was human. Um, I think that maybe the reason the angel of the Lord came to him to um, tell him that no one would die, that he was he. Um, had a purpose that he was supposed to go to Rome. He was supposed to present the gospel um, to Caesar. I think the angel had to tell him that because he was afraid. And then um, Paul was able to have that little bit of extra assurance there. Um, the angel brought a message and that word from God is what Paul chose to hope in and to share with others. Just like we have the word of God, the complete word of God in the Bible, we can follow what God's word says and have hope in those promises and what God tells us that we can then share those promises with someone else. So first of all, Paul was able to hope in God's word in the dark. Now, we talked about this before, but the, the verse says that there was no light, no sun, no stars for days. Um, the storm was winning. The storm had taken over the boat. Um, oh, here's that verse, verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, meaning this is a big storm. It wasn't a small storm. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. The hope that they should be saved through the storm was gone. But the hope that Paul rested in was what the angel of the Lord told him, the word of God. Sometimes it's in those dark moments that God speaks to us. Matthew 10, 27 says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetop. It was in that darkness that God called out to Paul to assure him that everything was going to be okay. Verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given them given thee all them that sell with thee. I wonder if God doesn't try to speak to us through our storm, but because we are so consumed with our storm, we don't hear him. 
we don't listen. Um, I know when you are going through um, maybe a grieving process, your mind is muddled. Your, um, your reasoning is diminished. You, you're not able to truly focus on anything. It's in those moments that you have to almost force yourself to read the Bible, force yourself to listen to the preaching because it becomes so hard. It's so hard to just put one foot in front of the other at that point. But not only does God try to speak to us in our darkness and in our storm, Satan definitely does as well. He knows when we are down, it is easier to attack us. It is easier to put doubts in our mind. Satan might say something like, you think you can help other people? You can't even get through your own storm. How are you supposed to help someone else? What what makes you think that you have the answers when you're not even through your own storm? I have definitely been there. I have definitely had those thoughts. What can I do to help someone else? They're feeling so down. They're feeling so um, out of place. What What can I do? But yet God is right there able to give you the strength in order to help someone else. You're not doing it alone. You're not, especially if you go with God's word, you're not even speaking your own thoughts, your own words. And sometimes it's not even what you say, but it's just being there for someone. It's just sitting with them. It's just hugging them, a knowing nod, a smile in the hallway. Maybe that's all they need instead of you're not going to be able to tell them some deep, you know, unknown truth of the Bible that will suddenly make everything feel better for them, but you can be there for them. Um, before Jesus was crucified, he faced, or while he was on the cross, he faced these same types of um, attacks from Satan in his darkness. In Jesus's darkest moments, Satan was right there telling him through people um, how futile this was. Luke 23, starting in verse 35, and the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them derided him saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Did you notice that all three of these different groups of people all said basically the same thing. If you were Christ, if you were truly the son of God, then you could save yourself. And wasn't that Satan's temptation to Jesus when he was out in the wilderness that he didn't, Satan would give him the whole world. He didn't need to go through this. Um, and if he was Jesus, then he could turn this stone into bread. That's That was Satan's tempting the entire time of Jesus's ministry. And then back to back, um, while he was on the cross to, I don't know, drive those, um, that spear deeper, drive those nails in his hands and his feet deeper. He cuts, tries to cut to him and says, if you were so powerful, you could just save yourself. And that wasn't at all what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to give himself for us. And thank goodness, Satan is not powerful than Jesus and Jesus was able to withstand that temptation. Um, Jesus dying on the cross wasn't for naught. Even right after these verses are said, verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, talking about the um, thief on the other side, said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not only did he save him, but because of that act, because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he has saved us. And he will continue to save those um, until he comes again. Just because we know who we are, we know who we belong to, we have the hope in the Bible, doesn't mean that we're not going to face our own storms and our own darkness. Of course it's going to come, but we can remember if we choose to follow in this path that no matter what we go through, that we can turn to God for refuge, for comfort, and for the truth. And we can do that by looking at his promises. The first words the angel told Paul were, fear not, Paul. He knew he was afraid. 
he knew that um, Paul might have been um, maybe even doubting a little about what was going to happen. Paul didn't, I mean, Jesus didn't um, berate him. God didn't tell him that he shouldn't be afraid. He just comes alongside him. And we've seen this through several different studies that we've done the past few weeks. God doesn't beat us over when we choose, when we forget, when we fail, when we start to fear. He comes alongside of us and he just gently encourages us, gently lifts us up. And he told Paul, just fear not. There are ways that you can strengthen God's assurance to you in the dark. You can do that through looking at his promises. Listen to this verse, Isaiah 41, 10. It's a verse you probably could quote to me. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, let's personalize this. And I'll do it for myself, and you can, you can say or fill in your name as we go through as well. Fear not, Amy, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, Amy, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, Amy. Yea, I will help thee, Amy. Yea, I will uphold thee, Amy, with the right hand of my righteousness. When I was studying, and even right then when I was saying it, it moves me to hear my name in that verse and to understand that God is speaking directly to me. It's when I read the verse as it's written, yes, I get it, and yes, I'm glad for it. Um, and I'm glad to know that truth and that promise, but when I put my own name in, something changes, and it brings tears to my eyes to know that, um, I guess, to just be reminded, and it's reiterated, that the Bible was written specifically to me, and that all the promises in God's Word are specifically for me. You can do that through the hundreds of promises written in the Bible. Just put your name in those verses and let it become something so sweet and so tender for you. And then he relied, Paul relied on God's purposes. Um, the angel tells Paul not only to fear not, but he gives him a purpose here. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sell with thee. This wasn't a wasted storm. There was a purpose. There was a plan. There was something that was supposed to happen. Romans 8, 28. Again, you could all quote this verse to me. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be the conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. One of the best things that you can do when you're in a dark storm is turn to God's word. Sometimes, like I said, it's a forced thing that you have to do, but it's so necessary make sure that you make time to be in God's word when you're in a storm. Not only did Paul hear from God in the dark, but he heard God with faith. He believed what that angel told him. It says in verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be a good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul heard what God said, and he believed it. And he kept on believing, even through the two weeks that um, the storm goes on. When Paul first spoke these words, it had only been three days of this storm. And then it goes on 11 more days after, verse 27. But when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. 14 days. And he heard this promise on day three. He had to keep believing this promise for 11 more days in the middle of that storm. The way that he believed is because he knew who God was, he knew who he was in God, and he knew that he could hope in what God told him. So again, how can we help someone in the middle of our storm? Number three, we have to be someone who has God's joy. Um, twice, Paul tells them, be of good cheer. Verse 22, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Verse 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. He could not have had this encouragement, and he could not have given this encouragement without having the, his own joy in his own life. Christian joy is not optimism. It's not blindly being so peppy and optimistic about everything. Of course, you're going to have bad days. Of course, storms are going to come. Of course, you're not going to feel like 
doing the right thing, saying the right thing. But God's joy, joy is different than happiness. Joy is constant because of God throughout any situation. Happiness is based on your circumstances. You can be happy that you had a raise and sad because you got sick for a week. Happiness is based on your circumstances. Joy remains constant because it is God's joy. God gives you that joy and it can remain constant. Um, Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you have that joy, it can get you through anything, any kind of storm, because it is your strength. How can you have this joy? 2 Corinthians 4 says, um, verse 8, We are troubled on every side, side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Paul points out that the Christian who's anchored to Christ can experience pain, but still holding on to that hope and that joy. Jesus even talked about this to his disciples before he was crucified. John 15, 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 16, 22, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. What is the difference between someone who has joy in her sorrow versus someone who sorrows without joy? Have you seen that difference in your own life or in the life of someone close to you? Have you seen someone who went through a trial and was able to joy have joy through the sorrow? Or have you seen people that have sorrowed without joy and are just completely despondent and it's like they've lost all faith in Jesus Christ? Know now that when you go through a storm to hold on to the joy that, ha that God has for you. And then number four, you have to be someone who cares about others. I mean, that's pretty obvious. If you're going to um, take a look at everyone else around you and remove yourself from the situation, you have to have a care for others. One of the threats to joy in the Lord is self-absorption. If we're all consuming with ourselves, with what's going on in our life, then of course we're not going to be able to look at somebody else. We have to lift our head up from looking inward and looking at ourselves and just look to the people around you and you can definitely find someone that you can care for and you can help. Paul definitely was not consumed with himself. He could have been fixated on his own struggles. He was a prisoner on that ship. Not only was he in a bad storm, but he was a prisoner going to trial. This all culminates into, to me, complete fear for Paul. Um, but instead of looking at his situation negatively, he looked again how he could help someone else with God's help. Look at verse 33, Acts 27. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. Remember, he is a prisoner. He is not an authority here, and yet he is taking charge. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer. That was all swears again. And they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls. 276 people on this boat. All of them looking to Paul. All of them being encouraged by Paul, a prisoner on this ship because of his hope in God and the joy that he had resting in his promises, knowing whose he was and the fact that he cared about the others in the ship. And then you just have to be someone who doesn't give up. At every turn that you have sorrow, that you um, feel hopeless, um, that you're going through something, you can't sit in a corner. You can't crawl into the fetal position and just, you know, suck your thumb, rock back and forth, crawl under the blankets on your bed and not get up for days. We feel like that. We want to do that, but you cannot give up 
in the middle of your storm if you want to help others. Um, going, reading on Acts 27, 41, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So the boat has hit land and the front part is stuck. And because the waves are so bad, every time they smash up against the back of the boat, because there wasn't anywhere for the boat to go, the back end was breaking up. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them for, from their purpose and commanded that they, which could swim, should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So some people jumped off the boat. They were able to swim to the land. Those that didn't know how to swim, they just grabbed onto something that they could float um, by the waves into the land. And there's no promise in God's word that says we will avoid hardness. Um, later, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We're not going to get around it, so we might as well learn how to endure it, how to get through it, and the best way that we can get through it. Um, and as we are seeing, one of the best ways to get through the storm is learning how to help others. Um, we look at how to endure something and we think that successful endurance is when we have a challenge and we get knocked down, we keep getting back up and then eventually we do that so many times that we come to this victory place, you know, and we see so many movies about that where, um, someone gets knocked down, they get, um, you know, they're down and out and they keep fighting, they keep going back and eventually they win, whatever's going on. But that isn't successful endurance that Jesus speaks about. Hebrews 12 verse 1, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which, which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Successful endurance is looking to Christ in the middle of our difficulty and going forward continually for him, even if that pressure doesn't let up. Paul does the same thing. He endured for over two weeks in this storm. He endured several other storms in his life, being beaten, being persecuted, and he kept going on. He did not give up. Not only through this storm, but also on the other side of it, Paul was able to continue serving others. If you read into Acts chapter 28, you'll see that there were people on this island that they were shipwrecked at that needed to hear the gospel and then people in the city of Rome he had a purpose God had a plan even through the storm and that is so important for you to constantly remind yourself of in the middle of the storm God has a plan God has a purpose even though you might not see it now even though you might not ever truly understand it God has a plan and a purpose for everything you go through you cannot give up in discouragement you cannot give in to despair because if you do, you will not be able to help people through your storm like God wants you to. If you want to help others while you are in a storm, you must begin by becoming clear on who, um, on your own identity in Christ. You belong to him and you owe your allegiance to him above all. You must then find strength and hope in God's word because God is the only source of sustained help. You must anchor yourself to Christ so your joy comes from him and not from your circumstances. You must resist the temptation to become self-absorbed, but look to the needs of others. And finally, you must refuse to give up. There are yet people who need the message and the service Christ has called you to give. We've gone a little longer today. It was a little bit longer of a lesson, but I was so excited to share that with you because I feel like it is so important. Um, this, yes, helps others. That's the goal. When you are in a storm and you look to the needs of others, obviously the goal is to help others, but... From personal experience, when I have been able, um, and sometimes I'm not, 
But when I have been able to look outward and even in the middle of my own storm, help someone else, it in turn helps me get through my storm. God wants all of it to work out for your good and for his glory. And so not only are you able to help someone else, but you're able to help yourself. Why wouldn't you do that? If God has designed it in that way, why wouldn't you trust him? Take him at his word and do what he's asked you to do and help those around you. Um, I won't spend any more time talking. Thank you so much for joining me. We only have one more week left. Be looking for um, maybe if you are a part of um, Joshua Baptist Church and our ladies um, fellowship page, I'll be posting maybe a question, um, maybe a poll later this week, later next week about um, what you would want to do moving forward. Um, just something real quick. I said I wasn't going to talk, but the thing that I have been thinking about the most is starting a podcast. And if you are unfamiliar with how podcasts work, I will definitely post a video to tell you and show you how to link up to that. It wouldn't be through YouTube. It would be through an app on your phone. Um, and that way I can, um, it can be something that we do every day. I would like to, um, what I'm leaning towards is doing First of all, a proverb a day reading we, where we would read together. I would read the entire chapter aloud and then give you a little thought from that. Um, also from another devotional that um, is very, very good. And we would go through that together. That's the thought right now. Um, if that's something that you would like to do, I would like to hear. Or if you think that that's not a good idea and you like these videos, I would like to hear what you would like to do moving forward. So. Um, you can leave a comment here. You can message me, text me, whatever you want to do. Or if you have another thought or idea, I am all up for suggestions. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week.